Good morning. I'm Thomas Acton, and I was a student helper at the 1971 World Romney Congress. I got involved with Romney people in 1967, when as a young student, I read about the foundation of the Gypsy Council in December 1966, and I rang up Grattan to come and speak to a group of anti-racist students at Oxford. Uh, he came down and he made an extraordinary impression. He was still very young, still had all his hair. He spoke very quietly, but with great passion. And he perhaps was the most charismatic person I'd ever met. Um, I think many people who knew him at that time would have followed him to the ends of the earth. Anyway, at the end of his lecture, he called for volunteers and I volunteered to help run the very first Gypsy Council summer caravan school on an unlicensed illegal encampment on a former military airfield in the London borough of Havering. Um, which I did do. Uh, that was, I, I ended up living with gypsies for a few weeks and running a school and getting some into school at the end of the summer. And that was a life-changing experience for me. And I remained involved with the Gypsy Council as a student helper really ever since. And I went on to try and do a PhD. I did do a PhD on Gypsy politics between 1969 and 1973 at Nuffield College, Oxford. And during this time, uh, I did a lot of chauffeuring Grattan around. Um, in the early 1970s, we had something called the Romano Commando, uh, which was a group of Gypsy Council militants uh, driven by me, which went to the site of evictions we've been told about and tried to resist them. And where possible, we took foreign visitors with us. For example, I took the Bulgarian uh, communist Romani activist, activist Demeter or Mikko Golimanov, uh, around for a week. Uh, he was allowed to come to England and we took him to resist uh, an eviction in Wolverhampton. Um, all this time in the late 60s, Grattan was working with the Comité International Rom in Paris to try and get an international conference, a World Romany Congress off the ground. And it continually foundered because Banco Ruda was trying to get the UNESCO Palace in Paris as a venue, and we never quite managed it. And so the best became the enemy of the good. We never quite managed to get something grand enough. And Grattan and some others grew very impatient with this. And they decided to basically bounce the Comité International Cigar into having a Congress by organizing a meeting in London to prepare for a Congress. But in fact, Grattan confided in me uh, that his plan all along was that if he could get enough people to come to this preparation meeting, he would declare it a Congress. And he got me as a student, then as a somebody who was already a graduate, a BA, uh, to organise an academic conference at St Peter's College, Oxford, with the help of Nuffield College, Oxford. And the idea of this was to get all the academic and policy workers who'd worked for gypsies, but not with gypsies, away in a separate meeting so that the Romani activists could hold their own meeting without being subdued by the great policy makers who'd kind of co-opted them to well-meaning policy organisations in the meantime. And I did this. I ran a, a conference at Oxford about a week or two beforehand and uh, the luminaries of Romani studies, the editor of, of Etude Cigarne and uh, the French magazine and Lachio Drom came to that and um, uh, and we held an academic conference and at that time there weren't many educated Roma. We got just three Romani people coming to that conference. Uh, they were Ian Hancock, at that time not even 
finished his doctorate. Dr. Jan Kokonowski, the first ever Romani PhD, and Matteo Moximov, the autodidact genius who wrote novels and translated eventually the whole Bible into um, the Romani language. And those were the only three. Uh, Kokonowski and Maximov knew each other. Ko Kokonowski had had a mental breakdown just before because basically the gypsy lawists, um, the French gypsy lawists, almost patronized him to death. When Madame David of Etude Cigarne walked into the conference, he went white as a sheet and clutched at my arm and said, that woman is trying to poison me. Not true literally, of course, but metaphorically, there was something in it. Ian Hancock, the young man then, had never met Romany writers before. And this was a revelation to him. You could see the wheels turning in his mind. Uh, we held that conference, and then at the end of that, those who were going to be in attendance on the Congress, which didn't include most of the academics, who kind of thought that they'd been to the main event already, um, and Matteo Maximoff became the translator for Romani, and Donald Kenrick the translator for French and all or the other languages almost at that Congress. Um, I remember Maximoff particularly because he had, he shouldered a tremendous burden of work. He was in every main session, translating it sequentially, which made the order of work slow because everything was translated into Romany and then into French as well as English. Uh, but I just remember him during the more empowered speeches, absolutely bellowing out translations. He took on the mood of the person he was translating. I can remember he translated We Demand Justice as Ame Mangas Chris, Ame Mangas Chris. And he, he bellowed it out just as if he was a Calderash Robin an argument where people had reached the point of something being seen as a intolerable and it needed the formal processes of justice to restore it. And that was the mood of the Congress. There had been injustice for centuries, but in our generation, in our lifetimes, we were going to end it and we thought we could. Uh, I was just a student helper. I was running errands. Uh, I, uh, worked getting people from the station, uh, getting people settled in their rooms. Uh, I can remember taking Juan de Dios Ramirez Heredia and his wife up to their room, all a bit small for a Spanish member of parliament. Uh, but people put up with living in small dormitories, which wasn't what they were necessary, because they could see that it was an important event. We were making history. And indeed, three or four days ago, uh, three or four days before it started, Breton had just confronted the leaders of the Comité International de Cigarns, said that there were so many people coming. He'd already given out press releases saying that it was going to be the first World Romany Congress. And of course, what could they do? They, could, they hadn't been asked, consulted beforehand, but they either had to go along with it or make it an utter fast. And of course, they went along with it. And the Comité International Cigar got renamed the International Rom, uh, in, interna, the Comité International Rom. Uh, and people agreed at that point that Roma should be the umbrella title for all gypsies, Roma, and travelers. Um, so there was a lot of discussion, me running errands, rather like Will Guy who was running errands for the Czech delegation. I was explaining and adding additional translation for the English Romanies and the Irish travelers who were present. Um, then on Saturday, we had a big coach trip organized up to Warsaw to the site at Slacky Lane, where just a little while previously, uh, the police had attempted an ev eviction and they'd attempted 
to tow away a caravan with a fire burning and a family inside it. And three Irish traveler children were burned to death when the fire caught entirely predictably of the caravan caught light. Uh, the children burned to death. Um, people were still in shock about that. That happened just before the Congress. And Colonel Thomas um, Holomek, the leader of the Czech delegation, uh, who was actually a Czech Rom military policeman and had been considered kind of like a little bit reactionary by other people there, including Jan Sibula, uh, who became president and who, who was a refugee from communist Czechoslovakia. Uh, but Thomas Holomek redeemed himself in everybody's eyes by leading a very determined delegation to the Warsaw police station and saying, asking them as a fellow police officer, how could it be that they took those actions which led directly to the death of three children burnt to death. Uh, it was an impressive occasion. Um, we had a ceremony where we burnt a tent in honor of the children at the site. And there are famous pictures of this taken by Eva Davidova. And then after some refreshments, which were supplied by the travelers on Slacky Lane site, we all got on the bus to go back to London. And on the bus on the way back, Yako Jovanovic, the famous uh, Yugoslav Rom musician, um, got the idea of adapting a folk song that he'd been playing with really since the late 1940s. He recorded various versions and it had been in the film of Petrovic. I even met Happy Gypsies. And he thought he could adapt it to become the anthem of the World Romany Congress. There were two traditional verses in it, the first two, and there was a third verse which had been composed in the concentration camps itself, which dis described how Roma had been massacred by the Croatian fascists, members of the SS, who wore black uniforms. They were described as the Black Legion. Um, nothing to do with skin color, it was the color of their clothes. Anyway, uh, and that had been used in the film. And he added a fourth verse and adapted the whole and simplified the melody a little bit so that it could be easily learned. And he composed it actually there, trying it out with all the people sitting on the coach around him as we drove back from Warsaw to London. And by the time we got to London, it was in the form which it was finally adopted. The next day was Sunday. Uh, what I remember most about that, actually, is that early in the morning, Matteo Maximov, who was a, an evangelical pastor, as well as a translator and an, a writer and a politician, he got the Christians amongst us up early to hold a little prayer meeting. And we prayed earnestly for all the delegates, for the success, um, it was a model to me of how my religion and politics should be inextricably intertwined, just as Matteo Maximov was. I wrote to him afterwards to say how influential that was. And he wrote me back a little letter that I've still got somewhere. He said, write to me more letters like that. That was very encouraging. Um, anyway, I actually dashed off back to my home church in Brentwood for a couple of hours in the morning and then came back to the afternoon session, um, which was the final session of the Congress and it adopted the anthem officially. It adopted the flag. That was a long debate. In fact, curiously enough, I, I noticed as somebody taking notes that the debate on the flag was the only debate in which every single official delegate spoke and gave their opinion. And then, uh, perhaps a little quickly, the 10, the, the, I don't know how, I can't remember how many, the official resolutions were prepared and they were passed. And the business of the Congress uh, was postponed for the evening. And there was a final farewell session in the morning before we all drove up to the um, Romany Festival 
which had been organized in Hampstead Heath, which the great singer Raya um, performed. I've got the tickets that were sold for there. Here's a copy. Oh. Let's, they're framed. It was a present for me from Grattan Puxon. There's one of the original 10 shilling tickets that people paid for entrance to the festival ground in, in um, Parliament Square. It went on all afternoon. Um, and brought the whole occasion to an end. It wasn't that many people, but we were swept up by the sense that we were doing something that people hadn't thought possible, that we were changing the world and that we would go on to change the world even more. In the 50 years since the First World Romani Congress, the number of educated Roma in universities has exploded. Of course, most Roma are still poor, most Roma are still oppressed but the number of roma gypsies and travelers who are educated active who won't put up with the kind of persecution the kind of prejudice that their ancestors had to tolerate just to survive has actually exploded people say things are not getting better for them but when i think back over 50 years when i think back what roma had then what Roma have now. The dangers may be greater now, but the weapons that Roma have at their disposal are much more. And I'm still immensely grateful to have had the opportunity to have been part of that and to observe the progress of the Romani people in the years since 1971. Thank you.